Hello and welcome back to Lenten Devotionals. We continue in our study of Colossians. Today we continue in chapter 1, focusing our attention on two verses today, verses 19 through 20, which says this. Oh, sorry, today is February 20th, 2016. <laughs> sorry. Okay, so today the two verses we are focusing on is, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. I love these verses um, because it reminds me of another text that I think is important to know and study on as you think about what this means. So let's pick this apart a bit. So the first part in the in verse 19, it talks about the fullness of God. So I think in order to understand the fullness of God, you've really got to, as one of my professors in seminary used to say, you have to inwardly digest what it means. What is that fullness of God? And so the Greek word is the same Greek word that is used in Philippians chapter 2. And I want to invite you to look at that with me. Because this is also another letter that Paul wrote uh, to a different group of people. This was to Philippi, uh, the Philippians. And so in Philippians chapter 2, if you look specifically at verse 7, it says, I'm going to back up so you can get a context here. It says, let, starting at verse 5, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. Now here's the, the connection. But emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. I'm just going to stop there. So this language in verse 7 that talks about emptying himself is the same Greek word that is used here in Colossians to talk about the fullness of God. Now what does that word mean? Well, there's <laughs> it's kind of a gross way of understanding this, but I think it's important that, uh, that you really understand what the Greek word is here um, so that you can really digest what this means and it's not a very pretty analogy but I'm just going to tell you <laughs> what it means when I was studying the whole book of Philippians I had to study the whole book of Philippians as well, dur during one of my classes and this is the literal translation here the fullness of God or the emptying of God is like your intestines like pulling out your intestines and turning them inside out that's what the actual Greek translation is so when you think about what is at the core of your body and what is mostly in your body itself, I mean, it's gross to think about, but it's really your intestines, right? And so if you were to pull all of that out and turn it inside out, that's what God, what Paul was talking about, how God emptied himself. In other words, took everything in his gut and turned it inside out for us. Now that is the same Greek word that is used here in Colossians when it talks about the fullness of God. So when we, when we are talking about the fullness of God or being full of God, you have to remember that analogy of almost being turned inside out. And that's a beautiful uh, way of really interpreting how God loves us. That God is willing to not just give a part of himself, not a thumb or a pinky or an eye or an ear but the actual turning of your physical self over to someone else that's what we are talking about here and so when you think about that fullness that magnitude of giving yourself um, that is a very powerful analogy for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell so in all of that um, exposing of that inside out that that God was pleased to dwell that God wanted to do that in Christ for us and that's who Christ is this in fleshing this inside out of what God gave and that's a beautiful analogy when you really think about it when you can get past all the gross intestinal language that's used in the Greek um, 
So the second part talks about being reconciled. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile himself all things, whether heaven or on earth. And, or in heaven, heaven or on earth. And so obviously there's this uh, eschatological language that kind of happens here too, um, which we talked, I talked about in the opening that sometimes is used in this chapter. Um, and we're going to hear more of as we get more into Colossians. And so here's the first reference of an eschatological language that reconciling of God, that means being restored to God or this exchange or change that happens. We talked about that in the earlier chapters. This, uh, um, this exchanging of Christ for us on account of his blood, on account of his sacrifice for us is what makes us righteous, is what makes us right with God. And, and I put it here in your notes that we become reconciled to God when God restores woman or man to be in right relationship with God through Christ. And so that reconciliation is only possible through the work of Jesus Christ. And I, and I love this language that it's on, on earth or in heaven. And so Paul's making this distinction that it was it is not just for the people that were on earth but that the people who were already been ascended, who have already resurrected, who are with God, and that Christ, uh, that reconciling, that, that relational uh, relationship that happens when, when we fully immerse ourselves into who Christ is, is not only for us on earth, but also to connect us with those who have already passed. And, and, and that's a beautiful analogy too, that our loved ones will also be reconciled on account of Christ. And, um, and so the last part is, you know, making peace through the blood of Christ. You know, there's a great sense of peace that can, that can come when you make the sign of the cross. I don't know if you've ever watched me um, before I um, read the gospel text, or uh, maybe you have noticed uh, something that I do. I, I often go like this. When the gospel is announced, I'll say the Holy Gospel according to yada yada, chapter yada yada, right? And so I wanted to explain what, what that means because it is it is a way of me honoring God, but also a, a way for me to um, to physically and spiritually invite God into my into my heart and in that moment. So what I'm doing is I'm saying God come into my mind. May your words be revealed on my lips. And God, I pray that you be in my heart. And may your may your word dwell in my heart. That's what I'm saying. I say that when I when I mark all those places and it was something I learned when I was young as a Catholic um, growing up in the Catholic tradition and it's something that has always stuck with me, and so whenever I read the gospel text, um, and it, it provides me a sense of peace and connectedness with God's word, and that's why I continue to use it. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying you have to do it, but uh, I mean, I know uh, one of the professors at the seminary, um, whenever he preached, he would often do the same thing, and it, it was just something that when I saw him do it for the first time, I knew that he had a Catholic upbringing too, and he and I had a conversation about that. But it's a sense of uh, inviting God to be in that peaceful moment so that God's word is revealed and that God's word really um, becomes a part of me so that I honor the God who emptied himself for us. And uh, so that's a beautiful analogy for you to think about, you know, or a way to think about um, the relationship that we have been promised with God um, here on earth and in the world to come. So I commend that to you today in your prayers. So let's close with prayer. God, we pray for peace in our hearts, peace in our homes, peace with friends and strangers, peace on earth and in heaven. Thank you for daily miracles of peace, big and small for the greatest peacemaking miracle of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Have a great day. Have a great weekend, I should say. See you Monday.